ભાઈઓ ને રિક્વેસ્ટ કરવા છે ફદાલી આગળ આવે رحم الله من قرأ سورة الفاتحة الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي بعد فلا يرى وقرب فشهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء وخاتم المرسلين وشفيع المظلمين سيدنا ونبينا بالقاسم محمد ولا اهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين اذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا واللانة الدائمة الباقية لعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم وغاصب حقوقهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم والمؤمنون والمؤمنات بعضهم أولياء بعض يأمرون بالمعروف وينحون للمنكر ويقيمون الصلاة ويؤتون الزكاة ويتيعون الله ورسوله أولئك سيرحمهم الله إن الله عزيز حكيم صلوات الله عليه وسلم محمد وآل محمد In our discussion on spiritual development last night finally we came to a point of starting the discussion about the process of spiritual development how is it going how is is to be done and we talked about the fundamental problem because one bef- before even we start putting things in the right place we have to first identify the problems and the fundamental problem that we discussed night li- last night was the issue of a ghaflat to be heedless not to really pay attention to the reality and in essence if you look at the ayat of quran where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about ghafilin these are those who don't use their power of intelligence or their eyes and ears the faculties in the right way they do not see through the reality they just look at the dunya but they don't see through the dunya and i would like to continue that process inshallah moving to the next step here but just few more remarks about the concept of ghaflat ghaflat is sometimes is also compared to sleep when somebody is sleeping we say he is ghafil <clears throat> of course ghaflat in that sense when we compare that with sleep we would realize that sleep can be of two types one is when we sleep and our eyes is closed that is known as naumat from naum but when we go to sleep spiritually and when the heart is closed the, uh, the eyes of the heart is closed this is where we call it ghaflat so it is also a sleep a physical sleep and a spiritual sleep spiritual sleep is the one which is known as ghaflat 
And this is where when we want to get out of it and seek guidance, we actually need the guidance of the ma'asumin. Because as the Prophet says, Tanamu aini wa la yanamu qalbi. My eyes can close, I can sleep, but my heart never sleeps. And that is the reality that, you know, when we talk about the issue of ghaflat. <coughs> Why does ghaflat happen? It happens because we just focus on this dunya. We don't see through the dunya to look at the akhirah, which is the reality. It doesn't mean dunya has no value. No, we build our akhirah only in this dunya. There is no shortcut. We are here in order to build our akhirah. And that can only be built here. But we have to realize that this is a transient phase of our you know, existence. We are not here to stay forever. We just have to gather the provision for this dunya as well as for the next dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about the ghafilun again. He described them in surah number 16, ayah 107 and 108. That these are the people. ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ اسْتَحَبُّ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا عَلَى الْآخِرَةِ these are the people who preferred the life of this dunya over the life of the akhirah. And Allah does not provide further guidance to those who are non-believers. Who are these people who prefer the life of this dunya over the life in the hereafter? These are the people who went to a level degraded themselves to a level that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then sealed their hearts and their eyes and their ears. They are not physically blind and deaf, but they are spiritually now, you know, blind and deaf. These are the people who are going through the state of ghaflat. <clears throat> we also reached the point last night that when a person is in ghaflat, the first step of spiritual building is yaqza, to awaken, bidari, you know, to come out of this state of uh, heedlessness. And there also we have to realize when somebody is in the state of ghaflat and if we compare ghaflat with sleep, you know, there are two kinds of sleep. One is a very deep sleep. Early in the morning, your father wakes you up, it's fajr time, get up, and you say, yes, I'll get up. But you are so deep in sleep that you say yes, but then you go back to sleep. On a spiritual level, those who are in a state of deep ghaflat, they're conscious if it is still there, will still call out and say, don't do this. This is what you're supposed to do. And they will listen to it. They will hear it, but they will not listen to it. They will go back to sleep. Whereas a person who is not in ghaflat is somebody who is constantly vigilant. At the first call, he comes up. And this is where we have to realize that, you know, in one of the du'as that we have in the month of Ramadan, you know, short du'as for every night, there is a du'a where we say, Allahumma nabbihni min nawmat al-ghafileen. Oh Allah, awaken me from the sleep of those who are heedless. So even the people who are heedless and ghaflat, that's kind of a nawm. Nawmat al-ghafileen, the sleep of those who are heedless. And a person who is in that state of ghaflat, sometimes he or she needs a spark to get out of that situation. You know, sometimes we see, and we, I'm sure if we just look around ourselves, if, it, if not ourselves, we will see there are people around whose life changed all of a sudden. Maybe they, they saw an untimely death of a friend or a family member which shook them in such a way they started thinking about it. What is the reality of life? And the person who died is gone, but at least his death, you know, shook this person to come out of the state of ghaflat. Sometimes we can come out of the state of ghaflat if we have somebody who can guide us, advise us in a very powerful way. 
whose words will go to our hearts. One statement from such a person can change a person from ghaflat to total yaqza and awakening. Let me, you know, give you the story of a person who is known as Bishr al-Hafi. <clears throat> Among the Sufis is considered to be one of the um, high-ranking masters of spirituality. He lived in Baghdad. This is the time when Harun al-Rashid had uh, brought Imam Musa al-Kazim alayhi salatu wasalam. <clears throat> and he put him into prison. He was in the prison there, but there was a, you know, this long story where he saw a dream. Where he was warned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That if he doesn't release the Imam, he will be punished right away. Right in the middle of the night, he calls his minister and says, you know. Just give him the permission. If he wants to live here, we will welcome him. If he wants to go back to Medina, he is free to go to Medina. So there was a time when Imam Musa al-Kazim was in Baghdad and not in prison. And so this is at that time that once Imam was passing by a street and happened to go by the house of Bishr al-Hafi. Bishr was an affluent person. And at that time when Imam was passing, the sounds that he heard from there was basically, you know, in modern times, there, were, there was a big party going on. Dancing, music, you know, many, many people there enjoying themselves. And when Imam reached to the door of that person, going through that street, at that same time, the maid or the slave girl comes outside to throw some garbage outside the house. Imam st stood there, stopped for a moment and he asked her a question. That the owner of the house, Ahuwa abdun aw hurrun? Is he a free person or is he a slave? This slave girl was surprised. Why would this person, you know, ask about my master in this way? He's very, very well known in, in, in Baghdad. He is, of course, a free person. And this is what she said. He is a hur. He's not abd. He's not slave of anyone. And Imam says, indeed, if he was the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I wouldn't be, wouldn't be hearing the, this, the noise that I hear from his house. Imam then went away. This is where when you have Imam and Noor giving you guidance, even if it comes through somebody else, it has a different impact. The master was inside and he realized that the maid took a little bit longer than normal to go and throw the garbage and come back. So he asked her, you know why it took, it lo took you long? And she says, you know, there was a holy man passing by and he asked me an unusual question and he said, the master of your house, is he an abd or hur? And when I said he is hur, he is a free person, he actually made a comment that indeed he is a free person. If he was the abd and slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he wouldn't be doing the things that he is doing. This message of the imam, coming not directly even to the, from the lips of the Imam, but through the maid, had such a powerful impact on Bishr that he got up. This is where the state of ghaflat is ending and the state of yaqza is coming up. There was a all of a sudden awakening happening in his heart. He got up. Didn't even think about his prestige. Didn't even wait to wear any slipper or shoes ran into the alley, asked where was the direction that this man was going, ran there until he reached to the Imam, got down, kissed his hand, and asked for forgiveness. And he said, Imam, I do toba today, I will never do such things ever again. And he became such a holy man, that he became a spiritual master of some of the Sufis that even now they consider them him to be one of their, their sheikhs. 
And in remembrance of that event, because he went to the Imam and kissed his hand while he was barefooted, he decided to remember that moment of awakening, his yaqwa, his state of, you know, coming out of this slumber and uh, heedlessness and ghaflat. To remember that, he decided never to put shoes or sandals again. And therefore, he is known as Al-Hafi. The word Al-Hafi means the barefooted one. Bishr Al-Hafi, Bishr the barefooted person. Salawat, <laughs> So when a person, now let's continue tonight. When a person in his spiritual, you know, development comes out of the state of ghaflat and there is awakening taking place in his heart, the first thing that he or she would realize that, well, I've come out of this state, but I have done many wrong things before. And so the first conclusion or impl implication of yaqwan awakening is to do tawbah. And what does tawbah mean? Tawbah literally means to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we say, Atubu ilayka, Wallah, I return to you. What does it mean? In a symbolic sense, by committing sins, I have moved away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now that I'm doing tawbah, I'm el eliminating that spiritual space between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so now I'm returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the literal meaning of the word tawbah. And this is an important step because we cannot just go through the process of spiritual development before cleansing our soul and our nafs. So we are not really rich to the positive side of it. We are still in the state of cleaning and you know purifying our nafs and that is done by the process of tawbah you know when a person for example has a problem in his physical heart because the artery is now becoming clogged up with the plaques and other things you know basically what happens the doctor doesn't just give you medication first they have to you know open up the arteries so that the uh, flow of blood becomes more normal. This is either done by, you know, operation where they will transplant the blood vessel from other part of the body and, you know, replace that with the one which is clogged. Or if it is not that much clogged, they will do what is known as ballooning, for example, so that at least the flow of the blood is there. And so before you start giving medication to a heart patient, you need to first clear those arteries. You know, the dirt. Space, in the sim similar way, when a person is going through the state of ghaflat, when the spiritual heart is sick, unhealthy, before we even go to the development stage, we need to clean it. The arteries are clogged with the plaques. The spiritual artery of the spiritual heart is clogged with sins. We have to clean that before we can move towards the positive side of, you know, strengthening it and energizing it even more powerful. Salawat <laughs> And this process of cleaning the soul is a constant process. We have to always do that because we are not masoom. The sins will come. Inshallah, less, lesser than before. But we have to constantly keep the nafs pure and this is what is known as taskiya. You see, when we talk about the purification and the whole process of cleansing, on a physical level and a spiritual level, we use two different names. If our body becomes najis, when we clean it, we call it tathir, taharat, isn't it? If the soul becomes dirty, we call it taskiya. There are two different words used. Tathir is for the body and taskiya is for the soul and the nafs. When there is najasat on, on the body, what do you use to clean it? What is the element used to 
purify the najasat on a physical level? It is water. What do you use in order to purify the najasat of the nafs? It is the tawbah. Tawbah is equal to water. Water is the means of purification on a physical level. Tawbah is the means of purification on the spiritual level. Water purifies the najasat on the body. And Tawbah purifies the najasat of the nafs. And the way these things are connected and important, actually the issue of Tawbah is even more important, is if you look at Surah Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one of the ayat, where he talks about the issue of physical cleanliness, taharat, about wuzu and ghusl and other things. It's amazing, sometimes we don't pay attention to the words. There is a long ayat where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about a ghusl. At the end, he ends with a very short sentence. He says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الطَّوَّابِينَ وَيُحِبُّ الْمُتَطَحِّرِينَ Allah loves those who do tawbah and he loves those who do taharat. Think about it. What is tawbah to do with the ghusl? But by putting it together in one sentence and bringing tawabin first, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a message. That remember there are two levels of taharat. One is the physical level where you do the taharat by water, by ghusl and wuzu and things like that. And there is one process of taharat where you do it by tawbah. In Allah yuhibbu tawabin, he brings tawabin first. He says, I love those who do tawbah, who constantly purify and cleanse their nafs. And of course, he loves those also who purify themselves from the physical najasa. Salawat pranayak barar. The door of tawbah is always open. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has never closed it for us. Tawbah is when we go back to him. Allah never abandoned us. Even when we deny him, he's still there. When we reject him, he's still there to give us. Tawbah means not that Allah came to us. Tawbah means we went to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His door is never closed. And if you look at this whole process of Tawbah, you know, right in the beginning of this story of Adam, and this is very important, we talked about it earlier in one of the majalis. All the elements that we need for success in the Akhirah is there in that story. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the potential that he has given to the human being, that we can soar to the level above the malaika. He also has given us the example in that story of shajar, temptation for good things. That beware, this is how you are going to be tested in this dunya. He also gives us the example that your main enemy is shaitan. The way he created problems from, for Adam alayhi salam. And then Allah says that, well, when the story ended, he says, I sent them down to the earth and I gave them guidance. So the issue of potential is there. The issue of temptation of material goods are there. The problem of shaitan is there in that story. The issue of divine guidance is there. Even the issue of tawbah is there right in the story of Adam alayhi salam. When Adam, you know, went through this issue, there was a conversation in the hadith of our imams <clears throat> where Adam says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, you know, you have given me this big challenge known as shaitan. It's going to create problems for me and my children. What have you given me to fight against it? And this is for us. You know, Adam is our Baba. And he is basically now negotiating with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on our behalf. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Adam, ja'altu laka anna man hamma min zurriyatika bis sayyatin lam tuktab alayh. Oh Adam, you want something? I'm giving you now. He says, when your descendants just do the intention of an evil deed, the intention of guna, but they don't do it. Maybe they didn't get, get the chance or the opportunity or whatever, doesn't matter. 
The intention of sin was there, but the sin was not committed. Allah says, I'll just ignore it. I will not write it down. فَإِنْ عَمِلَهَا كُتِبَتْ عَلَيْهِ سَيِّئَةً But if he does it, you know, realizes his intention now by committing the sin, then I'll write one sin against one only. وَمَنْ حَمَّ مِنْهُمْ بِحَسَنَةٍ Then number three, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if any of your descendants does the intention for a good deed, عمل صالح, but didn't, didn't get the opportunity, he says, even then I'll put that as a good deed. As opposed to the intention for the bad deed. فَأَنْ فَإِنْ هُوَ عَمِلَهَا كُتِبَتْ لَهُ عَشْرًا And if he does that good deed, then I will put the reward ten times. One good deed. Whereas in this scene, it was one for against one. Now Adam alayhi salam, and we should, have, we should thank our father there. He says, Ya Rabbi Zidni, O Allah, give me more. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Okay, if your descendants commit a sin, and I write it down, ثُمَّ اسْتَغْفَرَ لَهُ غَفَرْتُ لَهُ If he does istighfar and tawbah, I'll forgive him. Adam doesn't stop. Ya Rabbi Zidni, Wallah, give me even more. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, جَعَلْتُ لَهُمُ التَّوْبَ حَتَّى تَبْلُغُ النَّفْسُ حَابِهِ He says, O oh Adam, I have given the opportunity of, to your children that they can do tawbah till the last moment of their life. As long as azaz, azab doesn't come on us, we still have the opportunity to do tawbah and Allah says, I'll accept it. This is where Adam says, Ya Rabbi, hasbi. Oh my Lord, this is sufficient for me and my descendants. Salawat for And Tawbah, so Tawbah is an important step as far as, you know, preparing our soul to re-energize it with positive elements, which inshallah we'll start talking about it tomorrow night. But this is such an important issue of Tawbah. You know, many times the Christian missionaries talk about Islam and they say, you know, our religion is a religion of love. Your religion is the religion of Vengeance, you talk about Allah who is muntaqim and jabbar and he gives azab. You know, they actually don't know the reality. Do you know that in Islam, when you talk about major sins, the first one is a matter of aqidah, shirk, is number one in the gunahane kabira. And the second after shirk is what? To lose hope in the mercy and forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam is a religion which says you might be very depressed. You might be very low in your spirituality. But do not ever lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because losing you know, hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a major sin by itself. In surah number 39, ayat 53, he says, Qul to the Prophet, say it. Ya ibadi alladheena asrafu ala anfusihim. O Muhammad, say to my servants who have been unjust to themselves by committing sins, la taqnatu min rahmatillah. Do not ever lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna Allah yaghfiru al-dhunuba jami'a. Allah is willing to forgive all the sins. Inna hu huwa al-ghafuru al-rahim. He is the most forgiving and the most merciful. That is the rahmat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala linked to the process of tawbah and istighfar. You know, our spiritual uh, masters, when they talk about the issue of forgiveness and tawbah, they use a term, and this is not from hadith. They say, you know, Allah bahane ki talash mein hai. You know the word bahana? Excuse. There is no problem for him to forgive. He just says, give me an excuse and I'll forgive you. I'll just give you one example. You know, majority of the people in our community don't know Arabic. But at least, you know, still they do things. 
When we have a mu'min who dies, we have namaz janaza. <clears throat> Some of us start learning Arabic. All of a sudden they realize, oh, there is a problem. Because between the fourth and the fifth rakat of namaz janaza, there is a statement that we make in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where we testify, Allahumma inna la na'lamu minhu illa khayra. Majority didn't even know what they were saying. It's so okay. But those who start, you know, came to know the meaning, they said, oh, I can't do this. What does it mean? Allahumma inna la na'lamu minhu illa khayra. That, oh Allah, we don't know anything about this mayyit except good deeds. And then the mu'minin come and say, Mawlana, how can I say it? He was my friend. I know his bad and good everything. How can I be, how, how can I give a wrong testimony in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by saying I don't know anything about him but good? And so they start, you know, thinking about it. Should I even recite this sentence in namaz janaza This is where you have to think about this concept of bahana. Excuse. When 40 mu'mineen in namaz janaza of a mu'min when they say, even though they know he used to do bad things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looking from up will say, look at these people. They are so good to one another. Although they know bad things about him, they still conceal his defects. They are covering his defects. If they are doing this for one another, I am sattarul uyub. Because of this mu'mineen doing satr al for a fellow mu'min, that becomes a bahana for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, an excuse for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive that mu'min. Salawat pardon ek bara. So tawbah is a very important element in this, in this process of spiritual development. Let me go to a hadith of Amir al Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wa salam. And I use this hadith just to understand the importance of tawbah in our life. There was a question asked of Ali, Su'il an ma'na sujood. He was asked about the meaning of sajda. And the questioner was saying, you know, when we do ruku, it's one ruku. When we do qiyam, it's one qiyam. When we do takbir, it's one takbir. But when we do sajda, it's always two sajdas. So why is this so? And Amir al-Mu'min explains, he says, see, when you go into the first sajda, and you put your forehead on the earth, ma'anahu, the meaning of that stage, that amal, when you put your forehead on the earth, you are actually saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, minha khalaqtani. Oh Allah, this is my origin. You created me from turab. Turbat, it's earth. And this is where we have to realize, you know, what we have to learn from namaz and salat. Our whole body is important. But the most precious gift that Allah has given to us is this aql. Aql is not a material entity. But it works, the mechanism of that is this brain. And so the head is the one which carries the most precious gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by putting the forehead on the earth, this is a lesson of humility. Remember where you are from. Kullukum min adam wa adam min turab. All of you have been, you are the children of Adam and you have been, Adam was created from turab. Don't allow arrogance, the sense of, you know, superiority on the basis of your color or language or tribe. No. Kullukum min Adam. All of you are children of Adam and Adam was from turab. Arrogance has no place in Islam. And then Amir al-Mu'minin says, When you get up from that first sajda, this is a symbol of your birth. And you, as if you are saying to Allah, 
You've brought me to this dunya from this earth. And when you go to the second sajda, Amir al-Mu'mineen says, this is the symbol of your death. As if you are saying to Allah, wa ilayha tu'iduni. You are going to take me back into the earth when we are going to be buried in it. And then he says, when you get up from the second sajda, this is actually a symbol of the day of Qiyamat. Wa minha tukhrijuni marratan ukhra. And you will take me out of the grave second time on the day of judgment. When I look at this hadith, and then I started thinking about it, and this is where I say, you know, we don't really need to go here and there. For us, the source is the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt. The kalam of Amir is sufficient for us. When I look at this hadith, I started thinking about it. Ali says, when you get up from the first sajda, this is the symbol of your birth. When you go down into the second sajda, this is the symbol of your death. Where is the life? Where is the life? Between the two sajdas. How many seconds you sit? Huh? 10 seconds? 15 seconds? No more than that. That is the worth of this hayat of dunya. Those few seconds between the two sajdas. When you get up from the first sajda, that's your birth. When you go down into the second sajda, that's your death. In between, which is known as jalsa istarahiya, this is your life of dunya. And in the life of dunya, what do you do? What do you recite at that time? Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu ilayhi. Salawat pranay ek bar. Our, our life in this dunya is nothing but constant struggle to do good and whenever there are lapses and mistakes constantly doing Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu ilayhi. This is what I derive from these words of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Actually, you, if you think about it even more, other lessons that I can derive from it. When Ali says, when you put your forehead on the, on the earth, this is a reminder of your origin. This philosophy of sajda only makes sense if you put your forehead on the earth, not on the carpet, this whole law that we have in the Shia fiqh, that when you do sajda, either you do it on the natural earth, or you bring the earth inside your home. This concept of turbat and mohr that we have becomes meaningful when we understand this philosophy of sajda given to us by Amirul Mu'mineen. This wouldn't make any sense if you are putting your you know, forehead on the carpet. You know, our brethren in faith in other sectors, in, uh, sects in the, in the world of Islam, out of ignorance, they say, oh, we are turbat parast, mohar parast. They say, oh, you worship the turbat. You worship the mohar. This is total ignorance. This is propaganda against the Shias. We don't worship that turba. In Arabic, there's a small difference in when you say, Nasjudu ala turba, la nasjud lit turba. Ala and la. We do sajda on the turbat. We don't do sajda to the turbat. Nasjudu lillah, nasjudu illa al-Ka'aba. But our sajda is for Allah, although we face the direction of the Kaaba. And so do not ever, ever accuse us of being, you know, Mohar Paras or Turbat Paras, worshippers of Turba. If you think in this way, I will use your logic and reverse it. And start labeling you as carpet parast. 
Just because I'm putting the turba there and putting my head in sajda and I become turbat paras, I can reverse that and say you are turbat, you are carpet paras. Do you worship the carpet? No. Of course, we prefer that turba which is from the grave of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. One more lesson that I derive from this hadith of Amir al-Mu'mineen, just to extend what he has said. When he says that when you get up from the second sajda, this is a symbol of the day of resurrection. You will be brought back to life from that grave. What will happen on the day of Qiyamah? You will be asked questions. What happens in Tashahud? When you get up from the second sajda, that is Qiyamat. On the day of Qiyamat, the first question will be about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're already being trained here. You respond by saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wahidu la sharika la. The second question would be about the risala of our Prophet. You are being trained in salat. How to respond? Ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. And then what will be the third question? The third question would be about the vilaya of Ali Muhammad. And that is a training given to us right here. That after the shahadat of risalat of the Prophet, you say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin. Wa'ali Muhammad, salawat from the Iqbara. So you have the whole process there. Amir al muminin in his statement actually has given us in the daily namaz that we do a very powerful tool to understand the purpose of life and how to prepare ourselves for the day of Qiyamah. Provided we think about it, and utilize that vehicle that we use every day when we do our salat. Think about it. You know, when we recite the salawat, this is part of this, the salat of all the madhahib. The Shias on one side of the world of Islam to the Salafi and the Wahhabis on the other side. All of them recite this. And all of them say, Muhammadan Ali Muhammad. Ask them who are Ali Muhammad mentioned in this tashahud. Imam Fakhruddin Razi in his tafsir when he talks about Ayah Muwadda is a lengthy discussion about it. And he says there is dispute who are Ali Muhammad in this tashahud. He says there is total unanimity that in this Ali Muhammad, Fatima, Ali and Hassan and Hussein are there for sure. Muttafaq Ali, he says. About others, whether the wives of the Prophet are included in Ali Muhammad or not, he says, مختلفن fi. There is dispute about it. And so at least we know that the Shias and Sunni both agree that when we say the salawat in tashahud in our daily prayers, all around the world, the Shia and the Sunni alike, after the shahadat of Tawheed and Nubuwat, we also remember Muhammad and Ali Muhammad especially, Fatima, Ali, and Hassan, and Hussein alayhim salatu wa salam. Salawat from the Iqbal. You know, when we talk about this issue, I'm slightly going away from the topic, but since I reached to this point, let me add the final point also. Some of the Shias, I hope, Mombasa has not yet been afflicted with that problem. There is a whole debate among some Shias, oh, we should say, Ashhadu anna Ali and Waliullah in the Tashahud. Whereas our Maraj say, you are not allowed to do that because you do the namaz the way I have taught you. These people are so ignorant. They don't know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his own mysterious ways, in spite of all the opposition to the Ali Muhammad, he has sent the Salat 
through the Prophet in such a way that the Shias on one extreme and the Wahhabis on the other extreme all in their Salat, when they do the Tashahud, they mention Ali Muhammad. Baba, it is already there. It's not only Ali Waliullah. You have everyone there. In Ali Muhammad, you have Panjatan as well as the, the other Aima. If it's only already there that even the Wahhabis recite it, why you want to change things there? And so understand that. And the final point on this issue is that, you know, the majority of these Muslim scholars believe unanimously that Fatima, Ali, and Hassan and Hussein are included in this tashahud in Ali Muhammad. Just ask them one day. And we have no issue of, you know, insulting anyone here, no. One day if your Iman overflows, I challenge you in your namaz after Muhammad mentioned the name of someone else if you want. Bring Ali somebody else. Do that and ask your mufti whether your salat was batil or sahih. If mentioning the names of the people that you believe in is going to make your salat batil, don't ask me why I follow Ali Muhammad. Because Ali Muhammad are those whose name is there in the salawat in the Salat by all the Muslims and I would rather follow those whose name does not make my Salat batil. Salawat. When we talk about Tawbah, Tawbah is not just the process of, you know, saying Astaghfirullah and Atubu ilayh. No, it also is an issue of realizing that, okay, I had made mistakes in the past. And there is a need to redress the issues. If I violated the hukuk of Nas, the rights of the people, I had to fulfill it. Just doing tawbah is not going to be sufficient. If I missed the wajibat in the past, now I'm going on this path of spiritual development, I had to make up the wajibat. And this is a state of Tawbah, which is known as Inaba. Tawbah itself just means reforce, remorseful, you know, uh, regret and return towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas Inaba, which is very similar to Tawbah, means reformative return. I would like to redress the mistakes that I had done in the past. And this is where we have to realize, and I'll leave the details inshallah for tomorrow. You talk, we talked about the example of Hur. Hur for us is an example in that way. That he committed mistakes. But then the awakening comes in. In Shabi Ashur. Where is in, in his own words he used to say, nafsi bain al -jannati wa -nar. I found myself at the crossroads. Where do I go? And he was able to get out of his ghaflat. Although his journey was very short. From the point of yaqwa, his awakening. Till the point of kamal. Where he reached to the level of even above the malaika. Was very short journey. But he was able to cover that distance with the speed of light. Because he was helped by the imam of nur. And in that process also you see, it's not only the awakening, the tawbah is there. When he was coming to the, 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 the camp of the imam, in his words, he was already doing tawbah, Allahumma atubu ilayk. And tawbah by itself is not sufficient, you need to do inaba. He basically did that by giving the kafara. And the kafara was the sacrifice of his own life. For whatever he had missed, the mistakes that he had done, in the past and when you do the sacrifice of the life then there is nothing else that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would ask you and so this process of spiritual development begins with awakening and then you know it is the, the implication would be tawbah and inaba and that's where we'll be able to move forward inshallah salawat from the
آج کے مجلس میں بیداری اور یقضہ کے بعد توبہ کی بات تھی کہ اس کی اہمیت کو سمجھیں ہماری زندگی میں اس کا رول کیا ہے بہت اہم رول ہے جس طرح سے ہمارے لیے پانی ضروری ہے نہ صرف اپنی حیات کے لیے بلکہ کانسٹنٹ تہارت کے لیے اسی طرح سے توبہ بھی ضروری ہے کانسٹنٹ تسکیہ کے لیے تاکہ ہم اپنے نفس کو ہمیشہ پاک و صاف رکھ سکیں نماز میں جو ہم نے مثال دی ہے آپ کو امیر المومنین کے اس حدیث سے اسی کو ذرا آگے ہمیں بڑھانا ہے کہ نماز وہ نماز ہے کہ جس میں آل محمد کا ذکر ہے امام فخر الدین رازی نام لے کے لکھتے ہیں کہ اس آل محمد میں یقینی طور پہ اتفاقی نظریہ ہے تمام مسلمانوں کا کہ اس میں فاطمہ بھی ہیں علی بھی ہیں اور حسن الحسین بھی ہیں دوسروں کے بارے میں ڈسپیوٹ ہے کانٹروورسیز ہے لیکن ان چار افراد کے بارے میں کوئی ڈسپیوٹ نہیں ہے کربلا میں کون آیا ہے وہ حسین آیا ہے جو نماز میں شامل ہے مسلمانوں کے زہر کا وقت آتا ہے ابو سمامہ سیداوی نے آ کے امام کی خدمت میں درخواست کی شہدہ کربلا کی عظمت کو آپ دیکھیں ان کی درخواست بھی عجیب ہوتی تھی ان کی خواہشات بھی عجیب ہوتی تھی ان حالات میں بھی ابو سمامہ کے آخری تمنا کیا ہے کہ مولا جنگ تو ہو رہی ہے لیکن ایک بار اور ہم لوگ آپ کے اقتداء میں نماز جماعت پڑھنا چاہتے ہیں حالات کے تقاضہ تو یہی تھا کہ لوگ جو ہیں نماز خوف انفرادی طور پر پڑھتے فرادہ نماز پڑھتے لیکن ان اصحاب حسینی کی تمنا کو دیکھیں اور امام نے اپنے اصحاب کو مایوس نہیں کیا ایسی نماز قائم کی ہے کہ قیامت تک وہ نماز جو ہے تمام نمازیوں کی عبرو بنے گی امام نے جب یہ جملہ سنا ہے ابو سمامہ سیداوی سے کہتے ہیں تم نے نماز کو یاد کیا ہے خدا وند عالم تمہیں نمازیوں میں شمار کرے اپنے اصحاب سے کہتے ہیں ان یزیدی لشکر سے کہو کہ نماز کا وقت ہو چکا ہے جنگ کو روک دیا جائے ہم جنگ سے بھاگنے والے نہیں ہیں لیکن نماز کے خاطر روک دیا جائے بجائے وہاں سے کوئی پوزیٹیو ریسپونس ملتا یزیدی لشکر کا ایک سردار جس کا نام حسین بن نمیر ملعون تھا وہ ایک جملہ کہتا ہے جسے دہرانا نہیں چاہیے لیکن اس کی خباست کو بتانے کے لیے ہم اس جملے کو دہرا رہے ہیں جب اس نے امام کے اس درخواست کو سنا ہے کہ امام کہتے ہیں کہ نماز کے لیے جنگ کو روک دی جائے وہ ملعون کہتا ہے یا حسین صلاۃ کا لا تقبل دوزبدا اے حسین تمہاری نماز قبول نہیں ہوگی اے ملعون یہ وہ یہ وہ حسین ہے کہ تمہاری نماز میں اس کا ذکر آتا ہے آل محمد میں تشہد میں حسین شامل ہیں جناب حبیب بن مواہر حسین کے سب سے ضعیف العمر مجاہد تھے بچپنے کے دوست تھے اتنی قربت تھی کہ حسین بن نمیر کے اس توہین کو حبیب برداشت نہ کر سکے تلوار نکالتے ہیں اور حسین بن نمیر پر حملہ کرتے ہیں اسے گھوڑے سے زمین پر لے آتے ہیں لیکن اس کے سپاہ آتے ہیں اس کو بچا کے نکال نکال کے لے جاتے ہیں لیکن حبیب کا غصہ کہ ہمارے دوست کی توہین ہو یہ صرف ہمارا دوست نہیں ہے یہ امام وقت ہے یہ رسول کا نواسا ہے یہ علی الفاطمہ کا فرزند ہے اس کے بارے میں یہ جملہ کہا جائے یہ قابل برداشت نہیں تھا حبیب کے لیے اپنے حملے کو جاری رکھتے ہیں ازداران حسین یہ ضعیف العمر مجاہد کب تک لڑتا جب چاروں طرف سے گھیرا گیا ہے حبیب لڑتے لڑتے ایک مرتبہ زمین پر بیٹھ جاتے ہیں جب بیٹھنا تھا کہ ایک ملعون آتا ہے پش سے نیزا کا وار اس طرح سے کرتا ہے کہ انی جو ہے سینے پر آ جاتی ہے نکل کے 
اور حبیب کی روح جو ہے جسم سے مفارقت کر جاتی ہے ازدارانِ حسین حبیب کی عظمت کوفیوں کے نظر میں اتنی تھی کہ جب حبیب کا قتل ہوا ہے فوراں قاتل آگے بڑھتا ہے اور حبیب کے سر کو تن سے جدا کر دیتا ہے حبیب کے سر کو بعد میں جدا نہیں کیا گیا تھا اکثر اصحاب کے سر کو بعد میں قطع کیا گیا ہے لیکن حبیب کا سر اسی وقت قلم ہوا ہے اور وہ قاتل حبیب کے سر کو اپنے رسی میں باندھ کر گھوڑے کے گردن میں لٹکا دیتا ہے بس ایک منظر پر ہم مندلس کو ختم کرنا چاہیں گے مولا نے جب حبیب کے لاشے کو دیکھا ہے حبیب کی محبت اور بچپنی کی دوستی یاد آ جاتی ہے دعائے خیر کرتے ہیں حبیب کے لیے ازداران حسین جب یہ قافلہ جو ہے جب کوفے پہنچا ہے تو جو قاتل تھا حبیب کا اس نے حبیب کے سر کو اپنے گوڑے کی گردن میں لٹکایا ہوا تھا جب شہر کوفہ میں وارد ہوتا ہے تو جناب حبیب کا ایک جوان نوجوان بیٹا تھا جس کا نام تھا قاسم بن حبیب اس نے جب بابا کے سر کو دیکھا ہے تو اس قاتل کے ساتھ ساتھ چلنے لگا جب یہ قافلہ ابن زیاد کے دربار میں پیش ہوتا ہے قاتل اس سر کو لے کے جاتا ہے قاسم بن حبیب ساتھ ساتھ دے جب وہاں سے وہ قاتل نکلا ہے اور حبیب کے سر کو اپنی گردن گوڑے کی گردن میں ڈال دیتا ہے اس وقت قاسم بن حبیب آگے بڑھتے ہیں ہاتھ کو جوڑ کے کہتے ہیں اے شخص یہ میرے بابا کا سر ہے مجھ سے یہ دیکھا نہیں جاتا کہ میرے بابا کا سر تیرے گوڑے کی گردن میں لٹکتا رہے خدا را مجھے دے دو تاکہ ہم جا کے اس کو دفن کر دے قاسم بن حبیب سے کہیں گے قاسم ذرا سر کو اٹھا کے دیکھو زہین العابدین کے چہرے کو دیکھو یہاں ایک سر کا معاملہ ہے تم سے برداش نہیں ہوتا ہے زہین العابدین اپنے بابا کے سر کو دیکھتے ہیں چچاؤں کے سر کو دیکھتے ہیں بھائیوں کے سر کو دیکھتے ہیں اٹھارہ بنو آشرم کے اس سر کے صدمے کو لے کے اس زین العابدین آگے بڑھ رہے ہیں ماتمہ حسین یا حسین یا حسین یا حسین